first of all. Okay, continue. Right, okay. I wanna thank B, of course, beloved B for being so excited about my saying yes. And Dave for helping me kind of, there is some interesting structure to this talk and I will ex explain that in a, a little bit. But I, I think a general comment is that I do give a lot of talks to colleagues or especially to students that includes some of this material, but there's a special pleasure in sharing it with all of you because you're not students. And I, I just wanna say thank you. It's been an opportunity for me to reflect on, of course, a life as is true for all of us. The most interesting things that happen in our lives are the things we never ever planned. And I think that my life in global health and medicine and journalism and meeting Patrick, all of this, you know, this very much reflects that truth. So that's kind of an uber view. Um, so forgive me, this is quite autobiographical. I guess that's what you were hoping to hear, but it also weaves some kind of exotic stages and things I've done. But I will start at the beginning. So the structure of the talk is that the first half will be PowerPoint slides. And then um, in a previous talk I gave several years ago, because I have done a lot of medical journalism, I believe I read excerpts from popular articles I had written. But this time I am hoping to show you four excerpts of videos all shot overseas that Patrick and I worked on together. And these are very unusual places and stories. So each one will just be a portion. Um, and that is where the technical challenges may arise <laughs> with Zoom. PowerPoint is not a problem, but the videos, I, Dave and I did some rehearsals and I'm, I'm pretty confident it's gonna work, but there may be some moments where it doesn't go as smoothly as one would like, but being among friends, it makes it fun no matter what. So let me start with my PowerPoints and Oh, I need to share my screen. Obviously, I'm already goofing up. So share screen. And this is this. Share sound, except there's no sound with the PowerPoints. And how does that look? Can you all see? I'm gonna give you the full screen version. There we go. What I'm seeing is my slide and some faces on the right. It's fine with me. Is that good for everybody? Can everybody hear me? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. So I can't remember exactly, maybe I'll just go full screen. Anyway, I can't remember exactly what I gave as a title originally, but I decided to call it a life journey in global health a story of infectious diseases, exotic travel, and medical journalism. But, uh, you know, that really barely skims the surface. So <laughs> here's the beginning. Um, I am a native of Los Angeles, and here I am as a very small person being held by my mother in our backyard in Brentwood. And the only reason I'm sharing this is that my father said that from a very young age, I was the kind of kid who was very intently observing. And I think I see that in this photo. I am kind of an observer journalist type. And then the fun thing about this photo is that I'm wearing some Asian garb. I had an uncle who was a dentist who served in the Korean conflict and sent these wonderful silk pajamas. And I have spent a lot of time in Asia. So that's kind of whimsical and amusing to me. So what happened along the way? My family actually moved from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara when I was about 12 or 13. And I attended a local uh, small school, a country day school. So I am in the first row, this is my graduating class of 30 people. And I have, and I think you can pick me out, right? I'm in the first row, kind of short, dark haired. Um, what may amuse you is that I was 
not the star science student. I was a good student. I was expected to study. It was my job and I did it. Um, I was kind of more the star English student, if anything, and history, but I was very interested with biology. So um, I was born at Good Samaritan. That's why it says Good Samaritan to Brentwood to Santa Barbara. Uh, in, in my junior year, I took biology and I was doing work as a volunteer at the local hospital and that aroused my interest in medicine. I would say it was almost impulsive, but I became a pre-med. So when I went to college, I went to Stanford. Both my parents had gone to the University of California. They thought that was the best place for me. My brother was there. I would have loved to have gone farther from home, but I majored in history, but I was also a pre-med. And here's a picture of me with one of my best pals, actually um, both my junior and senior year at Stanford went to the Rose Bowl. So we were ready to go to the Rose Bowl. And by the way, Stanford won both of those years, 19. 71, 1972, okay. So by then I had been accepted into medical school and thankfully I was going to go farther away. I ended up in Chicago uh, at Northwestern, but in between graduating and starting medical school, there was a summer. And that was a very life-changing summer for me because I had had the opportunity to travel as a a young person. I was fortunate. My father was adventurous and he took us on long trips, both in the US and overseas and Europe, where we traveled around uh, kind of on a small budget, going and staying in inns. And it was very informative because that was in the early 60s. But I was uh, very eager to see something different. And the summer between college and medical school, I spent in Haiti which of course is very prominently in the news right now. And it was also very chaotic and difficult the summer that I was there. My brother, who was a, a year ahead of me, had completed his first year of medical school. I was going to start medical school. We knew about a small mission hospital in the north of Haiti through a friend. And we ended up spending the summer working there. And it was, talk about eye-opening. First of all, just being in Port-au-Prince, which looks quite beautiful in this photo, but it was uh, a time of uh, political upheaval and militias and Tom Tom Makut, all of that. And I, I wasn't even really that educated, but I got educated while I was there. This is the uh, waiting room of the hospital where I worked that summer. Um, this hospital was in a town of 15,000 called Lambe, and this town had no electricity. Uh, the hospital had a generator, so they had electricity for perhaps uh, an hour to a day. There was no telephone in this town, and the mail was delivered once a week by somebody who arrived on a donkey. So it was an incredible experience. And I would say for two or three weeks, also very uh, emotionally challenging, because you, you go from your comfortable life in the United States to the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. The people are marvelous in Haiti. They have a spirit, a joy. I spoke French. I was able to communicate with quite a few different people. But just the poverty and every day in this waiting room, somebody would die. I mean, it, there, were, there weren't enough medical personnel to see all of the people. And they would triage and they would take the kids and, they, you know, they did a lot with very limited resources, but it was primitive. And there were some missionary doctors and nurses and, you know, they were very heroic. And um, this, of course, when I was just about to start medical school, <laughs> I have to say, I was the only person in my medical school class who had a summer quite like this. It was like a very, you know, truncated Peace Corps experience. So I went from Haiti to Northwestern, which was a great choice for me. I actually loved being in Chicago and um, the medical school and law school and business school at Northwestern were um, right on the lake downtown in a really nice part of Chicago. Of course, it was cold, but I, I enjoyed the, the change in scenery, the architecture, the weather, everything about it. 
was stimulating, except that the first year of medical school is very arduous, which everybody knows, so I don't need to get into that. Um, the truth is I like Northwestern so much that not only did I do my four years of medical school there, I did my internal medicine residency there. But this experience in Haiti had really activated my interest in international health, tropical medicine. Remember, I was this, as I said, I was the star English student who was really, I, you know, my decision to go into medicine was not like I knew this was my calling. It was just almost like I was drawn to it without knowing why. And um, anyway, the tropical medicine experience I had stuck with me and Northwestern was very supportive. I mean, there, there was a really good culture there and they appreciated that this was something of interest to me. So actually, from the time I was, say, an intern, doing all the things that interns do, I began to reach out to various people and I learned about a very special school in London. And it is a one of a kind school. The London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is considered the first uh, school of public health in the world. And of course, it was partly motivated by the uh, uh, British colonial empire where a lot of people were going out to exotic places and developing tropical diseases. And a lot of those diseases were not very well understood. I mean, you know, it, it, they didn't know exactly how malaria was transmitted. And there were a lot of diseases that were being discovered and understood during the height of the British empire. But um, this school continues to this day to be an incredible institution for global health and tropical medicine. I'm very proud to have had the chance to attend this school for a six month course in tropical medicine, which Northwestern graciously allowed me to do because I, it required my taking a year off during my, during my internal medicine residency training. And here's a little bit of a taste of that year. Um, by 1979, uh, let's see, I just turned 70. So in 1979, I guess I'm 27. And I had been working very hard. I mean, medical school residency, I had great friends, but let's face it, it is hard work. And I would say that this was the first opportunity I had to, to both work hard and have a lot of fun and study something that I found intrinsically just, you know, mesmerizing. My particular course was for physicians. The class was composed of 60 physicians from all over the world. There were probably no more than five from the United States and maybe five or seven from the UK and, and uh, Europe, Western Europe. So there were a lot of different people. The guy sitting next to me was a really good friend of mine. He was from India. And um, in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a man being kissed actually by his wife. And just to give you another flavor about this school, it was the place for the US military to send physicians who were going to be leading major efforts in tropical medicine. The Navy, for instance, had medical research units in several parts of the world. So this friend of mine, Larry Laughlin, ran a couple of those medical research units, one in the Philippines, which I later visited, um, and also became the dean of the um, medical school that is run by the military. Naturally, the phone is ringing now, but I'm going to ignore it. Um, Call from Frank, Henry. Okay, I'm going to have to just let that ring. I'm so sorry. Um, actually, excuse me. Stephanie, I'm giving a lecture on Zoom. That's okay. I'll call you later. Okay, bye-bye. Always best to just deal with things. So anyway, so yes, Larry Laughlin became the dean of the, they call it the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences, but it's basically the medical school in Bethesda, Maryland. So it, this was an incredible school. And in the bottom right-hand slide is just, you know, we spend a lot of time doing work in the lab and identifying parasites under microscopes and attending lectures that were given by people who had worked overseas in the you know colonial empire as district health officers and there was an aging hospital for tropical diseases in London where we saw patients from all over the world it was just a great experience 
So the next chapter of my life was actually to attend um, the next stage of training. Remember, four years of medical school, three years of internal medicine residency, one year of tropical medicine. Then I decided I would go on and become a specialist in infectious diseases, which is one of the 12 subspecialties of internal medicine. For that, I went to Boston. I was at Tufts New England Medical Center. I did clinical work, I did lab work. And I had now been away from California for about 12 years, although of course I visited. Um, I was also able to start going to Asia around the time that I was uh, in Boston. And I, my first trip was actually for three months to Southern Taiwan. And I saw a lot of very interesting things there as well. I just wanna give you these kind of snapshots. I mean, I could talk on and on about the diseases, but that wasn't the purpose. I just wanted to give you the snapshots. So here you're seeing again a, a picture of uh, Boston near Chinatown, which is where the Tufts New England Medical Center, which is quite known for infectious diseases, by the way, um, is located. And um, I completed my fellowship. I did quite a bit of research. I published papers. I was competitive to be hired as a very young assistant professor at um, a medical school and be an infectious diseases specialist, and maybe do research or who knows what. And at that point, I think I really was ready. And so I took an interesting job. I returned to Los Angeles in uh, 1984, actually late 83. And I accepted a job that was a UCLA faculty position and I became an assistant professor of medicine and infectious diseases, but my employer was LA County. And I was the chief of infectious diseases. I like to call myself the chief in Indian because I was the only infectious diseases doctor at UCLA All of You Medical Center. Why are we looking at this blue building, which isn't terribly big? This is where I have to tell you a little bit about the history of All of You. All of You was the original TB sanitarium for LA County. And it was located in Silmar in a healthful setting where TB patients would sometimes live, you know, spend a year because it was created when there were no TB drugs. There was essentially no treatment except put people in sanitaria and hope that they get better and sometimes do surgery if they really had serious cases of TB. Um, over time, that TB sanitarium, which housed about a thousand people, um, was converted to a general hospital. So it became one of the four main county hospitals in LA County, all of you. This is all up in Silmar. The picture you're seeing is in Van Nuys. They built a new hospital and completed it six weeks before a major earthquake occurred in 1971. Some of you may remember that earthquake. In that earthquake, the brand new All of You Hospital pancaked and had to be raised and abandoned. Tragic. Um, and people, of course, died up there, too. But for the next 20 years, all of you relocated to the Mid Valley. And that's where I worked. All of you has now been, again, rebuilt and is a much more uh, you know, impressive institution back in its original site. But in the Mid Valley, in the mid 1980s, I was the only infectious diseases doctor we were right at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. In fact, when I started, we didn't have a blood test for HIV. We knew we had patients with AIDS. That was not hard to figure out. And we had a few things that we could treat them you know, for complications, but we did not have antivirals and we did not yet even have a blood test. We did not even have a test to make sure that we weren't transfusing blood that contained HIV. So that was in itself a really amazing and difficult time. Um, and things, of course, improved. Um, so I was involved with that, and I was involved with picking all the antibiotics, and I did pediatric infectious diseases because there was no pediatric infectious disease doctor. And I saw a lot of very interesting patients. Half of our population was Spanish speaking. I did see parasitic diseases. This was why I took the job. I was not really destined to be in that job 
forever. It was hard for me to leave because I was very well liked and I was really learning a lot too. But I reached a turning point and this leads me to a year that I took off between 1986 and 1987 when I was, re when I was uh, recruited back to the main UCLA Medical Center. So that, this is an old picture of UCLA's Medical Center. It's still, that building is still there, that brick building. But of course we have a fancy hospital that was built afterwards. So here's again, me in my office at all of you in the mid 1980s, me on the wards with some of my you know, colleagues or interns and residents. <clears throat> Just so you know, I really was there, really took care of sick people, which I have done a fair amount of. But I was ready to seek something new. So now we go to a year where I did a lot of the things that I have continued to do over the years. I was asked to join a fact-finding trip to the Philippines. And I was asked at the last minute, they actually wanted to bring people there because Marcos had been deposed, a very um, you know, terrible dictator. Uh, there had been a lot of corruption and there were a lot of medical stories that were never revealed of starvation. And you can see I'm at the bedside of a, of a child who's both very sick and also wasted. Um, in the other picture, I'm standing next to Corazon Aquino, who was then the president of the Philippines. This was just a really wild opportunity that came my way. And the reason it came my way is that they, they wanted this fact-finding trip. They had assembled a group of doctors and hospital administrators. Um, China Airlines had donated the uh, ability to transport human beings and donated medical cargo, but they realized they had nobody who was an expert in the diseases and the kind of poverty and global health problems that we would be likely to encounter on this trip. So that's why I got picked. And I was very excited to go when I was available to go. The LA Times was also involved. So some of the um, things that we saw were documented and even um, you know like front page articles. Uh, so all of that was really quite interesting. And that's just one, anecdote. Another thing that happened in that year off between all of you and, um, and uh, resuming some duties at UCLA was that I answered an ad in the New England Journal of Medicine because uh, Lifetime Television, which was the big cable network at that time in the 1980s, was devoting all day Sunday to programs about health and medicine. The, most of the Lifetime programs were produced out of New York, but the Lifetime medical TV programs that were broadcast nationally on Sunday were produced in Los Angeles. So I answered an ad and I walked into offices on Cahuenga Boulevard with about 50 people, all seasoned professionals, producers, you know, et cetera. And I became part of a team. And the very first day I met Patrick. So that is where our lives began to intertwine. He didn't know I was going to be showing up. I certainly didn't know I would meet him. I was just one more medical editor, i.e. kind of a medical fact checker, you know, expert on his staff of 10 people for a program that he was producing. And, um, I mean, it was kind of magical. We actually met on St. Patrick's Day in 1987 and I launched my second career. I didn't ever plan it, but I had a background that you know made me very interested in communications and writing. And I just began to learn you know, like a sponge from everybody that I worked with, Patrick, the writers, the other people that were there. And someday you'll have to ask him you know, his perspective. Anyway, over time, I ended up working on a number of programs at Lifetime, not necessarily with Patrick, um, including a kind of a weekly, I, I used to call it the PBS News Hour for doctors. It had a lot of medical news um, and stories. And I was both a writer and I was an on-camera reporter. And then I was a co-anchor. And 
what this really meant is that when I went back to UCLA, when I was being recruited back as an infectious diseases doctor and a tropical medicine specialist, because they did not have anybody like that, I said, I'm going to take this job if I can have enough discretionary time that I can continue my overseas work and my new career, which I didn't yet know where it was all going. So anyway, that was very, very serendipitous. And I, uh, of course, you now know that the relationship with Patrick um, was a very successful one and that we got married a number of years later and we have had um, terrific adventures along the way and he had been doing medical television shows. He had, of course, come from a background in uh, first the mailroom at CBS and then as an editor and had his first Emmy by the time he was 30 and had had multiple awards by the time I met him. But just so happened he was at Lifetime Medical Television. So actually he had quite a bit of experience covering medical topics as a producer and a director. So there was a really fascinating kind of uh, synergy, you might say. And uh, of course, got to show a couple pictures of dogs, even those, though these are our departed beloved dogs. We have two more of the same general breed. Um, so now this is gonna lead uh, pretty soon to these video clips. But because it turned out, thank, thanks to Dave and the rehearsals, <laughs> that it, I'd really better go through the, um, <clears throat> the PowerPoints first, and then try switching back and forth on video clips. So I'm gonna show you some slides uh, from PowerPoints that will give you a little bit of a picture of, of the four locations where we ended up doing the films I'm gonna talk about. The first one is this film, 1993, Armenia Aftermath of an Earthquake. In it, you see Patrick carrying a tripod <laughs> and a camera amid rubble. You see him in a hotel lobby. Um, and then I guess if you see the pictures on the right, I'm still, you know, I, I should go full screen that way. I wouldn't be seeing these other, I'm afraid to though. I'm always afraid I'm gonna press the wrong button. Anyway, can most of you see the baby and the woman collecting firewood? Okay, good, all right. So. At this time, we were both still at Lifetime, but Lifetime was winding down its um, medical programming. It was really not even a, a financial decision because they were making good money. It was the first time that the FCC had allowed pharmaceutical companies to advertise on the public airwaves. So there were pharmaceutical ads. Um, there was quite a, an enthusiastic audience for the programs on Sunday because the public had really never had access to the kind of medical information that was often covered in those programs. It's very different today with the internet, needless to say. So I was the, at that time, the, um, the co-anchor of a weekly program and Lifetime actually wanted the documentary that we proposed. We had friends who were working in Armenia in the aftermath of a, a, a very major earthquake and Armenia was a newly independent state. So, um, and they were at war with Azerbaijan. So they were dealing with multiple challenges that affected public health. And we had friends who had been working there as philanthropists, USAID was there, but it was a really tough time. And, and we went there five years after this enormous earthquake that uh, displaced 10% of the population of the country of that new independent state. And we filmed under the most, I mean, this is typical of Patrick. Of course, he just said, sure. <laughs> you know? But we, he ended up filming under conditions that were near impossible. Because uh, once again, there was almost no electricity, no fuel. Um, but he got great footage. The documentary was never completed because at that point, Lifetime, when we came back, had decided that they were going to be all seven days a week women's programming. <laughs> But um, we still had this incredible uh, experience, which you'll see a little bit of in that video. Here's another show that came about. It's called Hepatitis B, The Global Challenge, uh, which we did together in 1999. By then we had formed a production company, we were married. 
And um, a friend of mine, a pediatric infectious diseases doctor who was a specialist in uh, viral hepatitis had gone from UCLA to a pharmaceutical company, uh, Glaxo, uh, it was Glaxo Welcome at the time. And he was actually responsible for the first FDA approval of an antiviral drug for hepatitis B, which is a very widespread and major uh, problem worldwide. A lot of people with chronic hepatitis B don't know that they have it. It can kill them. So the whole goal of this film was to shoot in six countries, Philippines, Korea, China, Thailand, Hong Kong, and the United States, and, and tell the story in a way that would allow local viewers uh, to understand this disease that was so prevalent often where they lived and even might affect them, and they, they didn't even know about it. it. It was a really interesting project. That piece was later um, broadcast in multiple translations in Asia and purportedly seen by 200 to 300 million people um, and was paid for by Glaxo Welcome, but not an advertisement. It was really a public service documentary. So that was a really wonderful experience. And Patrick's holding a camera, I think, in a portion of the slide I can't see. And this is our cinematographer, Jim O'Keefe, who remains a great friend to this day. And here's me with some laboratory researchers. Okay. The third video clip is going to come, is going to be about malaria, and it's going to be from Africa. And it reflects a period when I was doing policy work in Washington, D.C. I had the good fortune to work with a lot of global health economists in my career at UCLA and elsewhere. And um, this was a kind of a burgeoning area, uh, uh, era for global health investments by the U.S. government. And of course, malaria was always a huge killer in Africa, kind of a silent killer of children. At the same time, HIV AIDS was beginning to be a very uh, major killer of people in Africa. But I'm gonna focus on the malaria piece. And um, once again, I have to say, Patrick is the kind of guy who would always just say yes. <laughs> um, why was he doing a film? Well, I was mainly involved in this two year policy report, which turned out to be a three or 400 page book that I was a co-author of. Um, the, the International Committee of Blue Ribbon Experts was headed by Kenneth Arrow, who is a Nobel uh, laureate economist who's uh, died a few years ago, but uh, lived to be a ripe old age and was at Stanford. He was a delight to work with. We had people from uh, Africa, we had people from Europe, we had people from the US. It was just an amazing experience meeting with them. And at the time there was a big conference that we all attended or many of us in, in Africa. And then the idea was for somebody like Patrick um, and me helping to capture the real experience on the ground of what malaria was doing. And so that was what um, led to this short film in Tanzania. Meanwhile, of course, I'm not traveling all the time and I'm not just doing video work. I'm at UCLA and um, I am traveling some. There is a picture of me here where I went to Albania uh, during the Kosovo refugee crisis. Uh, there's a picture of me in Pakistan. <laughs> it's a picture of a friend from visiting from Taiwan. This is one of my offices at UCLA when I was teaching on the main campus as well as in the medical school. So clinical work, teaching, travel, collaborations. I'm also continuing to work as a medical writer because there was a point at which I kind of switched from being on camera to doing print journalism. So I was writing for Discover, Scientific American. Um, the Los Angeles Times had a health section for about 10 years and I was a columnist. I wrote a, a monthly column um, called The Doctor Files, which was a story-based column. So I was able to weave all these things together and UCLA gave me permission early on. And um, I just, again, I feel very blessed. I also continue to write and uh, do what I call quasi-journalistic writing for, for medical journals. So that's the purpose of this slide. And um, one of the favorite things that I like to do is to actually organize panels for some of our national medical meetings where really great science writers come and, and we can talk about their work. So um, these are just some great books and authors. You may or may not recognize them, but um, I've helped to organize those kind of things. 
And finally, um, UCLA has its own magazine, needless to say, and I, I think we did share this COVID-19 diaries that I wrote uh, interviewing six of my younger colleagues who were on the front lines. Um, the piece on the left is a picture actually of my parents when they were married in 1944. My father had returned from Guadalcanal. He almost died of malaria. That's another reason I think I've always been interested in tropical medicine. Um, and, uh, you know, I could go on and on. This is a favorite patient of mine who had a liver transplant because she had an exotic parasitic infection that uh, destroyed her liver. And um, foodborne infections are a special interest of mine. So this is just a taste of kind of this weird eclectic career that I've had that has interwoven all of these different elements. So finally, in 2019, as some of you may know, I, without really planning it, uh, reiterating the theme that the best things that happen are the things that you don't really plan, I ended up beginning to produce a film of my own about an exotic parasite that I first saw in Taiwan in the 1980s. It is a foodborne parasite. It's now in five continents. It's in the continental United States and Florida. There have been people who have gotten this parasite. Um, there's a map here, so you can kind of see where it is. Um, it's in Florida, it's in the Southeastern United States, it's in the Caribbean, it's in um, South America, it's in uh, much of Asia, it's in Africa. And it flies underneath the radar, but when humans are infected, they can have a mild and somewhat inapparent illness, or they can have an illness that is fatal because the parasite migrates into their central nervous system. So it's a, a somewhat undertold story. I have a lot of personal connection with people who work in Hawaii on this, and it just seemed like a story that needed to be told. So that is the final excerpt. I am looking at my watch. We had, so I think we have time now. So I'm going to stop this. I think this is the last slide. Oh no, here it is. Okay, this is the last slide. The um, the name of the parasite, common name, is rat lungworm disease, which of course is kind of a turnoff. It's certainly it's arresting in its own way. But you know, a lot of parasites have animal hosts, and a lot of parasites are worms. Some are not. Some are single cell protozoa. So the title of the film is Accidental Host, The Story of Rat Lungworm Disease. Um, and I'm going to just show you the opening of that as the final video excerpt. This young man, this beautiful young guy who's now in his 30s, um, as you can see, was in the ICU. He was very sick with this. And he is one of our several featured patients, um, Graham, who's in the film. And that is his mom, who is incredible and also has done a great deal to help raise awareness and education around rat lungworm in Hawaii. Um, so it's going to be a 50 minute film, mainly for educational distribution, although, I mean, we're pretty hopeful it'll be broadcast on PBS in Hawaii. And yeah, there's some possible possibility it could end up streaming. The main goal really was to create an educational film, but it's just taken on a life of its own. Patrick, of course, has been a important creative consultant, but I have been the producer. We've had a wonderful editor. I've had, I have a co-writer and, you know, longtime friend, colleague of Patrick's and longtime friend of mine who's been incredibly helpful <laughs> cinematographer. I mean, the whole shebang. We've done shoots in Hawaii and Florida and Los Angeles. So that is the last slide. So I'm going to stop my share. And now, this is the challenge. I am going to try to show you these video excerpts, which means I need to share a screen again and go to my videos. Share sound is on. Um, and I am going to start with the Armenia video. And I know you're seeing a lot of weird things, but it's going to get better. So hang on. Um, During the earthquake, I was in a bus going to school with my sister. We 
got scared and came back home. As we reached our building, it was a nine-story building. I lost my mother and my sister. I was at school when the earthquake started and our teacher said, I apologize. This is what we were worried about. You can't see the picture. I know that. So let me start over. I think I needed to do a new share. Ah, uh, okay. New share. Try it again. By the way, you'll see about half of this. That's about all we can do. During the earthquake, I was in a bus going to school with my sister. We got scared and came back home. As we reached our building, it was a nine-story building. It was gone. I lost my mother and my sister. You need to share your screen. I was at school when the earthquake started and... Sorry. you're sorry. sharing your browser. You need to share your screen. Oh, you know, this is, I, <laughs> so I need to go to stop share and share screen. And then pick out the screen and then pick out the video that you want to show and then show it from there and it should show. Okay, thank you all for being so understanding. No, that's not it. Not now? Nope. No. Oh, gosh. This was the nightmare scenario. <laughs> but it's not a nightmare. <laughs> it's just what it is. Um, so I press share screen press share screen and then did you did you click the two buttons at the bottom of the share screen window no. okay turn those on and if you start the video and pause it then you should be able to share the video as well and it should work from there Now I'm not getting the applications I want, but um, I'm tempted because of time not to do the Armenia. I apologize, but I, I don't want to take up that much time with this. So I'm going to try a different one. And I think we'll do the hepatitis B. Maybe we'll have more luck with that. Is that working? You're not sharing the screen yet. Yeah. Patrick tells me that you cannot see that one either. Is that correct? That's right. We didn't see a picture. Oh, darn. You didn't share anything yet. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, think sure. I, I'm sharing a screen. Okay. But then I need to share again. Uh, then I need. There we go. Oh no, you're back at the slide. Yes. New share, do you think? Yes. Are you sure you're share you're playing the video and not the audio? The world over. An ancient enemy is still at large. 
a relentless killer that recognizes no national boundaries, no social status. A disease with... This is, this is, uh, this is frustrating. <laughs> what can I say? This is frustrating. Um, what did we do yesterday, differently yesterday, Claire? Yeah. We, had, we got it working and I think you did something different in order to get the picture. I know we did and I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I'll try this again. Thank you for bearing with me. I, I'm happy to take questions and let this part go if it's becoming annoying, which I think it might be. Um, in a way, this does not do justice to watching, you know, either, but it is a way to see it. Do you need to get the video on your screen before you share your screen? It's on my screen. It's been- That's the every, problem. She sees every, it, we don't. I see it oh, every I get it. time. I see oh. it. I, I have to run to the living room to see if Patrick is seeing it. <laughs> I that's, see. That, that's what I've been doing. And um, no, I haven't started. Not seeing it. The world over and no. is still at large. A relentless killer that recognizes no national boundaries, no social. I think I am going to take the speaker's prerogative and say that I, I'm very sorry, but I don't see these, this as working. <laughs> yep. and, and I'm not going to, I, I'm very sorry, I can't show you these video clips. Um, maybe next time I'll have my assistant. I do, I, when I teach at UCLA and use Zoom, I have an assistant. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Kind of takes over. Um, um, can I ask a question then? Yes, please. Well, I, you have mentioned um, occasionally about this rat lungworm disease, and yeah. I and it seems like something that we could encounter should we travel or eat in Hawaii or buy food or um, go to Florida or. Um, and maybe you talk a little bit about what that is and. Uh, how one gets it. Yes, of course. The rat lungworm um, is uh, something that people can inadvertently consume, especially if they eat un underwashed greens or sometimes undercooked seafood. And it's very important, for instance, that people who live in endemic areas, and there are areas, I mean, in parts of Hawaii, 75% um, of rats and a lot of the intermediate host, which is a variety of slugs and snails, can carry this. Now, you would think, I'm never going to eat a slug or a snail, right? I'm going to see it. But the very juvenile forms of these mollusks can be very tiny. So if you picture yourself going to the farmer's market, in Hilo, Hawaii, or Maui, or eating from a rustic food stand, um, there have been many cases in people who do that, and clearly, you know, they didn't do it by choice. Occasionally, there are cases in people who do eat odd things by choice, and there's some sad stories about that. In fact, there have even been cases in, in guys in the military who are on these survival courses who end up eating a giant African land snail or something like that. But mainly it's people who have no idea. Um, originally, the infected snails were brought by the Japanese to Pacific Islands as a source of food. Very large land snails are considered a source of food in parts of Asia. They, if they're cooked, they're fine. But if they are undercooked, and this is what I saw in Taiwan, I saw children who either put a, something in their mouth because at a certain age, we tell this in the, in the film, of course, at a certain age, children can put anything in their mouth and they you know, aren't responsible. They're just doing what is part of the normal stage of development. But um, the fact is that 
uh, the Japanese brought the snails because people were starving and it was a source of protein. And both rats and mollusks spread in ways that you'd be surprised. You know, rats jump on ships and get into new parts of the world and mollusks travel like snails and slugs travel on plants. So this probably accounts for the fact that we now have this disease present in um, rats and snails in parts of the Southeastern United States. There was a very famous outbreak I'll give you a story that's in the film of medical students from my alma mater, which is Northwestern, who went to Jamaica on spring break. Mm -hmm. And they all, a bunch of them ate the same big Caesar salad. And a month later, 12 of them came down with meningitis and brain infections from this parasite. Wow. And this, yeah, this was in the New England Journal of Medicine. We have two of the students who are now, you know, this was about 20 years ago. Two of those students are in our film. Um, and it's an incredible story. You know, they went, on, they went to Jamaica. They, they, maybe they should have been a little bit more concerned about eating a fresh salad, <laughs> but they sure didn't expect something like this. They probably thought, well, maybe I'm risking getting diarrhea, but um, there's probably a lot more of this disease than we know because some people are not that sick and they just recover. Or the fact is that you really can't be diagnosed until you, receive, you reach a certain stage and you have a spinal tap. There's no good blood test. So it's a somewhat elusive disease, both in terms of um, understanding where it is and then having good diagnostic tests. Um, in the course of doing this film, I've been working with some uh, colleagues at NIH who are working on a better diagnostic test. CDC does have a test, but it's not that sensitive. It doesn't pick it up in the early stages of the migration of the parasite. So there's a lot of interesting challenges. It certainly doesn't, um, it doesn't equal COVID. It doesn't equal many infectious diseases, but it shows you how ecology, um, the, the changing ecology uh, can affect uh, a certain kind of infectious diseases. And, you know, it's foodborne. So if in our film at the end, um, by the way, the film will be done in the next couple of months. So we'll figure out a way to have a proper showing. It won't be as hard as this, I promise you. But um, there are definite uh, messages for tourists because people are traveling all over the world. They can go to Hawaii and end up back in you know, the Netherlands and a few weeks later uh, come down with this odd illness that is not understood or diagnosed. And treatment does make a big difference. Prompt treat prompt diagnosis leads to treatment, which can prevent major complications. So I would say that, you know, my least uh, favorite food for eating in Hawaii would be a green smoothie that is made from kale or something like that, that you don't know if it's been washed. Um, there are people in Hawaii who are trying to educate the population, certainly on the Big Island, Maui. These are places where people know about this disease, but a lot of tourists don't. And especially people who are staying in bed and breakfast, staying off, you know, not staying at big hotels where I think they are much more careful about the cleanliness of the product and, you know, trying to protect the the patrons, the clientele. So I don't know if that helps. Does that answer the question, Linda? Sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's kind of an ecological story as well as a medical and a clinical story. And of course the patients that we had the privilege to interview are very interesting. You know, they're, the interviews are very engaging and we have experts. Mic on. Yeah, well, as I said, this was only half of what I hope to show you. Patrick, what, what would you like to say maybe about some of the other projects that we've done together since I wasn't able to show them? Can you unmute yourself? Go to your lower left. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> But, but so what so we we from my standpoint 
I, I don't know, it's just, it's been a, such a great opportunity to travel around with the woman I love, get into these kind of adventures and these challenges that we both had to, we're, we're dealing with. And there were, there, I don't think there was a, a, a ter, for all of the exoticism and disease and, and this tragedy that, that we uh, observed, for us personally, it was, it was always very fulfilling and, 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 and soul, soul filling <laughs> to meet those people and to see the suffering and seeing the care, caregivers. The caregivers, my gosh, we talk about the caregivers here, COVID. What we really see, we've seen uh, a whole lot of other ones with the, facing different problems. So it's just been, a, for me, a, aside from being married to Claire, which is non -com incomparable as, as a privilege, <laughs> but uh, just as a filmmaker, boy, she, she's really given me carte blanche into some wonderful role. With the people of Armenia, for instance, uh, where after the earthquake, and the earthquake had happened in what, the 80s? When did it happen? the earthquake happen? Uh, the earthquake occurred in 1988. We yeah. were there in 1993, and yeah. that rubble was still there. 10% of the population was living in these uh, cargo containers that had been converted into like mm -hmm. houses of sorts. Um, mm -hmm. And there was a shortage of food and there, was, and there was no place for us to stay when we left the main city of Yerevan. Uh, even in Yerevan, it was very primitive. And these um, people- Stayed in houses, people's houses. At, yeah. And uh, they, they were at, uh, at war. Was Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan was able to cut off their their supply of, of uh, fuel oil, and there was electricity only from something like one o'clock in the morning till three o'clock in the morning, and uh, I mean certainly the, <laughs> they were they were they were really suffering financially and had very little to to live on. Yet every home we went to. There was what you call a groaning board, you know, a table that is just so full of, of delights and uh, food to welcome us. Uh, it just, I don't know how they were able to gather that together, but they always made a, a feast for us. And uh, that, that experience alone was just so affecting and memorable. I, I, I want to mention something psychological because I think this is really, again, I mean, you can call it providence, you can call it serendipity, you can talk about anything you like, but to have a partner like Patrick for somebody like me, it, it wasn't just, you know, a romance, it was, um, it wasn't just a combination of, you know, I have a certain kind of medical background and a certain set of interests and he has an incredible amount of talent and craft. I don't think that I would ever have had the, the moxie to take on the things we did. I mean, I'm adventurous, but you know, there is a quality that Patrick has that is kind of like, say yes, don't say no. <laughs> don't think of the negatives, think of the positives. And that has been displayed over and over when we've, gone on these overseas trips. And by the way, I just thought of the perfect solution. If there are people who would like to see these videos, I can send links to Vimeo where all you have to do is click on the link. Dave, maybe I should have thought of this sooner, but I don't think it mm -hmm. works so well for this Zoom. If you would like to see, um, the Armenia video is a sampler. It's about 17 minutes. It's grainy, it's black and white, but it is very vivid. And you really get a picture of what it's like to live through this time there. Of course, it's much better now. Um, the malaria video is about six minutes. 
The Hepatitis B show is actually a 30 minute show, but you can watch the first five minutes if you want, it's up to you. Um, I'm not being immodest because it's not my filmmaking, it's his. They're all really one of a kind. So I can provide those links to this. Oh, yeah. Belinda, if you're here, wait, wait, Claire will just can give you those links we put into a phone. Yeah, I, 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 I apologize for the technical difficulties. I think if I were smarter, I could have overcome them, but I just reached, <laughs> yeah, I reached that, that point. <laughs> and I'm a very, you know, normally I really stick to time because that's, you know, important in television, but it's also really important as a teacher. And uh, I knew that we were just reaching that point of that breaking point. So, <laughs> But I'm happy to answer more questions if people have questions. You yeah, have a question. Yes. Um, uh, my, okay, my, my question is on this, this horrible disease, the rat lung worm disease, um, you mentioned the areas where it is found. But what is the percentage of prevalence? I mean, how, how many people get it? Is it extremely rare? Is it very common. I mean, what's, what's the number of people that get it? We do not have a good handle because there is no good test. Of course, of to, course. Yeah. To define exposure. Right. Having, having said that, I do not believe it is incredibly common, but I think it is a lot more common than we know. And this is the next stage is to try to define the um, the prevalence, at least of prior exposure. If you go to the big island of Hawaii, for instance, you could do a, if you had a proper test, you could do a survey. Now, Hawaii may be the perfect storm in a weird way, even though it's common in Asia, in Asia, people are more likely to cook things. I think it's a wisdom that has come through the ages. Um, there are some dishes in Thailand that involve eating marinated seafood and marinated snails. So if you go to some really rural areas, it's pretty common, I think, in those places. But so is, is just general good washing of uh, fresh produce just enough to get rid of that? It should be. It should be. We have a segment in the film where we, another serendipity, there's so many serendipities in this film, I couldn't begin to tell you, but one of them is that uh, in Hilo, there's a really nice restaurant. Hilo, of course, is really old Hawaii. It's really kind of a fun town to visit. Um, there's a good restaurant called Cafe Pesto. And the owner is related through marriage to my medical school roommate. <laughs> and as a result, you know, there's very few restaurants where they would allow a film crew to go into the back and, and watch how they wash the lettuce so that they don't give people rat lungworm disease. It's not good PR. In fact, the whole Hawaii tourism agency is is very is very uh, ambivalent about talking about this disease. It's not what tourism, you know, bureaus normally like to stress. But at Cafe Pesto, the executive chef, we have a great sequence where he shows us exactly how they wash the lettuce, and it takes an hour. And, and he uses. Oh. Local he, he uses local lettuce from, I think, the most exquisite Japanese American truck farmer. Shizu, you will appreciate this if you're still with us. You know, just beautifully grown, maintained, romaine. And then we watch the process. And as he said, this exec executive chef, who's originally from the mainland, said, you know, we really want to use local produce if we can. We're really conscious of safety. That's always gonna come number one. So have I eaten salads in Hawaii? Yes, I've eaten salads, but I would be very picky mm -hmm. about where I ate a salad. And we, do, we have the patients to sh who can tell the stories that you know, they, they are, we have an ICU nurse who got this. She had taken care of patients with it. People who were in the ICU on a ventilator, she herself, very meticulous, very seasoned professional. And she got this. Huh. So, you know, now she just doesn't eat anything that isn't cooked. But it can happen, I think, inadvertently. There's even some concern that maybe some of these 
tiny juvenile mollusks can get into the water tanks. There's a lot of theories about, but mainly it's a, it's foodborne and it washing should make the difference. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Is that enough exotica for one? Oh, wait. <laughs> Are you trying to ask a question? I was going to ask a question. Please. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> we all think of uh, that all the diseases have been discovered, but there must be a large number of diseases out there that we haven't discovered yet. I mean, is there any estimate as to how many <clears throat> pathogens, <laughs> amoebas, or viruses are out there that we still don't know about? Uh, it's a great question. <clears throat> I think that there are undiscovered, um, you know, species. Whether it's uh, bacteria, it's single-celled protozoa, which are technically parasites. Whether it's, you know, I I don't know how many, um, so I can't answer your question very specifically. But in my own, I think of diseases as well as pathogens. In my career, when I think of all of the new agents that have been described and cause significant illness, in my personal medical career, it's a long list. You know, it's not just HIV, it's, that's a big one. But um, we also have, of course, the antibiotic resistant organisms that are a whole different class of threat. But um, yeah, I think there are undiscovered viruses. And I think that human behaviors and, you know, global movement and even, you know, what you eat. I mean, everything, food alone is a very dynamic thing because people continue to eat different foods, right? Different preparations. Uh, so we're going to learn more and we're going to have more descriptions of things that were not previously in the medical textbooks. Mm. Kind of a vague answer, but yeah. <laughs> Claire, yes. I want to ask, you know, you as a person, I just marvel at your, how do you say, your wide range of interest and kind of pursuing and you're involved in something new, then you see another tangent and you want to go into that tangent, then you see something else and you go into it. Is that something in your uh, behavior of your whole family, mom and dad and your brothers? I don't know, are you the <laughs> only one in the family that, I mean, I mean, I just marvel at how you have pursued all these interests and could change and then adapt and then create another thing and keep going. I mean, I've never met anybody like this. <laughs> well, I, I'm embarrassed if if you think, I, thank you. I thank you for that comment and compliment. Um, I came from a family that expected, I just have one brother. And I think, you know, my parents were serious, hardworking, but, you know, people with wide ranging interests and we were expected to be serious students, but in a way there wasn't an ex expectation that, you know, okay, my father was very happy when I said I was gonna be a doctor. In fact, sometimes I think I, I became a doctor because I was afraid to say, guess what, dad, I changed my mind. <laughs> you know, there, that happened, that was a thought that went through my mind more than once. But we were expected to, you know, be productive and I guess in a way creative. Uh, I, I don't think I ever, it never crossed my mind to have a private practice in medicine. So there, you can see from the beginning, I wasn't seeing medicine as a, a doorway to a very traditional uh, medical life. I saw it as a tremendous opportunity and privilege to learn about human beings and, and hopefully be of service um, and then I think what happened is I just saw various doors open where some of my talents, which aren't incredible, I don't have incredible, I know a good writer when I see a good writer, I don't consider myself to be, you know, like the world's most fantastic writer, but I have some skills and creative talents. So I saw ways that I could blend these, you know, things I knew and, uh, you know, they, 
they came to me when they started the LA Times health section because somebody knew me. They wanted a doctor columnist. They didn't want to hire me. I wasn't going to be a LA Times staff writer. I didn't have that kind of training. But I did have stories and I had enough skill to write those stories and start writing that column, the doctor files. I also had a wonderful editor. And so, you know, I'm a big fan of editors. Uh, every time I've written something that's been published that's really good, it's because I had a good editor in addition to it, something good that I was doing. So, you know, I have learned over time that I'm just kind of open to opportunities. And maybe, yes, that's partly the way I was raised. Uh, but it's kind of a hallmark of a somewhat creative person. I have both sides. You know, I have the science side, but I, I guess in a way I am unusual for a physician. Um, and I am so admiring of many of my colleagues who are incredibly fine physicians and so dedicated and they just, you know, they're willing to do the same thing or they're willing to operate day in, day out. I mean, I, I can't speak highly enough for them. I'm not like that, I think. That's part of my answer. Yeah, okay. What did your mom do? Well, my mother um, graduated from Berkeley. She was, uh, very aesthetic. Actually, she she played the piano. She loved to garden. She did not have a, a she had a job after she graduated from Berkeley because she worked for the Bomber Command in San Francisco for two years during World War II. And then my my father came back from the Pacific and they met and they got married. <laughs> um, so my mother was, um, you know, she was a lovely person and a great had a great home. She was a great cook. She was very inspired by Julia Child. I mean, she did the things that she was. And by the way, she studied Japanese for a while. She, was, oh, really? <laughs> she had a really lovely friend who was originally from Japan and she decided to take a course in Japanese. Now she didn't get very far, but I think that was her spirit as well, if that says something. If she had lived in a different generation, she definitely would have, I think, had a professional life, but she was raised in a different time and um, she was also quite dedicated to, you know, being a homemaker. Well, thank you so much because my, you're most, oh, I'm embarrassed. I admire you, I really do. Oh, you know, I'm 70 and I'm not doing some of those things now, so, but I do like writing and I do, this film has been a really important learning experience for me. I've never had a role quite like the role that was put on me. Patrick knew all along that it was, I mean, he's done this so many times. He's been the head of a team. He's been a producer. And uh, I, I think he was both very, very, very supportive of me and knew far more than I did how hard it was gonna be. <laughs> It has been, and the you know pandemic didn't help because our couldn't meet with the editor in person. Everything was kind of remote, but it, it's working out. Actually, we're getting close to the end. Patrick, yeah. you want to say something more about that? Well, I'll just say that uh, she's done a wonderful job, and uh, it's a it is a whether you're a fan of tropical medicine or or whatever, it, it's a compelling, fascinating film. And she, she just did great with it. She ran with it and it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, and also it's a lovely, it's a beautiful piece it has some beauty too. What, one yeah. of the interesting things about it, I would say, and uh, the other work that I've been exposed to that Claire's spent her life doing is that the, the one thing when we're putting a television show together on these microbes and these parasites is, not, is to avoid demonizing these creatures. One of our interviewees, one of Claire's interviewees in the show said, you know, they, they, they don't want to be in us. They don't want to be killing us. <laughs> what they do happens sometimes to, to end up that way. But so these, you know, these guys, these little guys, they're, they're on the spectrum of life, of, of living creatures. And uh, I think maybe for me personally is that's the most important lesson I've learned. But uh, 
and that's certainly true of Claire's documentary on on this parasite. Uh, it's an, it's a fascinating creature. It's deadly as hell, and uh, causes you know terrible tragedy. But uh, it's doing its thing. It's surviving. And uh, well, the, the, the name of the show is Accidental Host. I mean, the parasite doesn't normally enter humans. It's a, it's it's the it's the exception, not the rule for a human to have this. Normally it's in rats and snails and slugs and it just continues. And how that cycle started, you know, from the beginning of time, nobody can answer that question. That's true of many parasite life cycles. They're bizarre. How did this happen? And that's something that we start with actually at the beginning of the show. The other thing I'll just say about the program and what I've benefited from is just, it's so incredibly collaborative. Even if you're the final decision maker, it's so pleasant to work with a group of people who are committed and like-minded and supportive. And uh, I've loved that. I've loved interviewing everybody who appears in the show. I felt like I got to know them you know, so well, and they were very honest with me. And that quality is something that I uh, enjoyed even early in my television career. And I think that is something that maybe my personality is well suited for. So if I can use that to good, you know, effect, I, I feel gratified. Um, this is probably corny, but uh, every one of these productions is it, it's, it's, it's a collaborative medium. And what, 40 people have worked on your show, 50, 60 people have worked on your show. And the, the cliche that I'm gonna throw at you is uh, it takes a village. And uh, <laughs> sorry about that. But it, it, it really is a community thing, you know? And uh, the good, you know, the, the good producers are aware of that. And the, the people who are part of that community are aware of that as a value, not, not only as a, as a skill and a way to make a living, but as a value in the, in the relationships that you have and the give and take, it's really a remarkable thing. And uh, Claire fit right into that and plugged into that, uh, uh, just like, a, you know, a gang of horses, whatever. But, and, you know, yeah. So yeah, it takes it takes a village, and it's quite a village. <laughs> and, and all of the people who worked on this have, you know, charged us a very reduced fee because they know this is not a commercial profit making. You know, if it if it were to generate income, it would go back into the foundation that paid for it. Um, obviously, I don't get paid for. <laughs> my work, but people who do work on it need to be paid something, but they've, they've really done it out of a uh, commitment to the project. Um, so that's been very heartwarming. We even have an animator who is in Boston, who's done work for Nova for 20 years. And he is, you know, giving us some incredibly nice uh, elements and, and charging us way below his normal rate. So I guess that says something about the bondedness of the community of people working on it. I could never have done it without all these other people. So, Well, using Patrick's cliche, I think it's an honor and a privilege to have you, you two in my village as well as a Pasadena village to get to know you. So thank you, thank you. Okay. Yes, Claire, uh, thank you so much for doing this. I, I don't even know quite how to thank you. Oh, I didn't do it's, much. Uh, I, I blew the technology. So. <laughs> it, it's an honor to have you. Oh. And for you to say yes when, when I ask you <laughs> to do this. Um, I, I just don't know how to thank you. But anyway, thank you <laughs> for doing this. And thank you, everyone, for coming to watch this. Uh, it's lovely to see all of you here. Thank you. For, thank you. Thank you. Thank Bea. you so much, B. And thank, thank you, Claire. Bea. Thank you for everyone 